I can see that little one. Okay, so let's start in the hall. sit you down in one of these two front parlors and most likely he would serve you some tea and you would do your business with Trent or have, have your meal or whatever you were doing. So I'm going to take you to the best parlor first. This is the best parlor. This has the fanciest furniture, the nicest woodwork, the most woodwork of any room in the house. And they made an attempt to keep the floorboards even in this room, which you will not see in the rest of the house. Um, it was very difficult to cut them evenly, I would imagine. The time. Back then, yeah. Yeah. Um, and in this room, we have a mixture of antiques and reproductions. Um, for example, the darker chairs in the corner that you see there are antiques, and the reddish chairs are the reproductions. We also have this Japan furniture in this room. These pieces come from China. But this method of painting and lacquering in gold is called Japaning. Now we know from the probate inventory that Trent had several pieces of Japaned furniture. Um, so we, you know, we went out and bought comparable type of pieces. So we've got this table, the corner cabinet there that would have held cups and dishes and sugar and tea for entertaining. And then on this side of the room, we have this table which is really neat because it has these different sections that open up. You see that? Right. So you can open it up and it turns into a gaming table with green felt, a writing desk, a tea table, and a music table with a music stand. So there's four or five ways you can have this table. It's pretty ingenious. And then we have, this is an 18th century mirror. That one is a reproduction on the other side of the room. And so, you know, they're having parties in here, they're having business take place in here, and this is where Trent would have seen his most important guests and business associates in this room. So we can head across the hall. Okay. This is the front parlor. It's not quite as fancy as the best parlor. As you can see, there's not quite as much woodwork in here. Um, but this is still a formal parlor for entertaining, seeing guests, etc. Now, all the furniture in this room is period, so it's all about 300 years old. And if you look closely at the chairs here, you'll notice this crown motif carved into the chairs. See that? That's uh, because, you know, during Trent's time, it's about 50 years prior to the Revolution, and we're a British colony and loyal to the king this, in this time period. So they're carving crowns right into the furniture. And then another thing I want to point out in this room are these king's boards. These super wide floorboards are called king's boards. And the reason they're called that is because normally they're set aside for the king for shipbuilding. So technically Trent is not supposed to have these and they would have been very expensive because they're so rare. So this is his way of showing off how wealthy and powerful he is by having these in the middle of the floor like this. Uh, you know, look, look what I can get from right. so far away. Yeah. So expensive and everything. It's supposed to be for the king. I mean, I'd have the main walkway coming in too. And you can't miss yeah. them, right? Because they're right in the middle of the floor here. And then we have a meal set up here. As you can see, they ate plenty of food. And we know from the archaeology that's been done here that they were eating beef and oysters because we found the bones and shells. And this is um, mashed turnips, bread stuffing, bread, and then the desserts there. And they're drinking either tea or wine or both. And um, I'm going to talk about the odd looking utensils when we get into the next room. So that's the front parlor. This is the 
back parlor, as you can see, this is a very plain space. It's because this is not for entertaining. This is just for the family. Um, but lots of activities took place in this room. They would bathe in this room. Um, somebody would bring a tub up. You know, probably one of the slaves would bring a tub up and, and fill it up, warm the water up at the fireplace and fill it up. And then um, they would take their baths. Now, they're also eating in this room, drinking tea, you know, whatever, playing games, reading the Bible, just anything you can think of, really. And um, we have some items here. So, typical fork and knife from that time period. This is very sharp. You wouldn't want to put that really in your mouth. So, they use these for, like, poking meat, shredding it, etc. Once you had your food cut up, you're going to eat it from an eating knife. This is dull. You're not going to cut much of anything with this. So they were actually putting the food in their mouths with the knife rather than using fork. it like a spoon. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Or you could use a horn spoon. That they had these. These are carved from an animal horn. Now Trent had a full farm here, lots of livestock, cows, sheep, etc. So plenty of raw material that could be used to carve these spoons. And then they're using the Chinese porcelain teacups. At least the wealthy were because you could afford it, you know. And they have no handles. So rather than drinking it this way, they're actually pouring small sips into the saucer and <laughs> drinking it directly from the saucer. It was referred to as having a bowl of tea. You know, when you pour it a little sip in there, it'll cool it down, and then you drink it that way. Actually, it's a good idea to do it right now. <laughs> yeah, why not, right? Um, and then here we have the sugar that you've got for your tea. This is a cone. These were imported from the West Indies, and it's very, very hard. It's like a rock. So you're going to need this device called sugar nippers in order to cut off a piece of that cone. And they would put it directly in their mouths. They would not put it in the cup. Sugar was super expensive, so they could just put it right in their mouths so they didn't waste any. Yeah, so just some everyday items that they would have used. So I'm going to take you up and show you the main bedrooms first. youngest and the only child of his to live in this house. He had three children from his first marriage. They were grown and living in Philadelphia by the time he moved here. So, the tiles depict scenes of children playing. We've got kite flying, fishing, jump rope and a hoop and stick. I'm sure you've probably seen a hoop and stick before. So this is a very popular toy colonial times. Basically, you just roll it along and hit it with the stick and keep it going. Uh, okay. If you've ever been to Colonial Williamsburg, I'm sure you've seen those. And then here we have some children's items. They played with red clay marbles, they played with cards. Um, this is like a, a typical child's textbook from that time period. It's called the horn book. And the reason it's called the horn book is because it has this thin sheet of animal horn that protects the paper underneath on both sides. And you could pull this part off and switch out the lesson and then replace the horn. Played with rag dolls. And then this looks like two girls in the picture, right? But this is actually a boy. Uh, boys wore dresses in colonial times, basically until they were potty trained or turned about five. Once they turned five, they graduated to all this stuff. The, uh, the wave, the vest, the breeches, the whole nine yards at five years old. Now we all wore dresses when we started out. Yes. When you first started making clothes, it was just something that wrapped around you. Yeah, right. 
That's right. <laughs> All the Romans and the Scottish and yeah. I mean, Sometimes I wish I could wear one in the summertime. It's all around, keep you cool and you don't sweat. That's right. <laughs> so this is William Trent's bedroom, and you'll notice this bed. Um, his bed is called a camp bed or a campaign bed, meaning it's the same design as what a soldier would have used in the field. It's actually portable, collapsible, and portable. This could be packed up and moved in, in, you know, put in a wooden box and moved somewhere fairly easily. Now this one's larger and more luxurious than the average soldier's bed, but it is that same design yeah, so that can be moved. And then we've got some everyday items that would have been used here. Now Trent is not shaving himself. He's most likely got the butler shaving him. Now I don't know if I would do that though. These butlers and everything were slaves. That's right. I don't want one of my slaves with a right razor next to my throat. Yeah, I know. He must have had a very trust, <laughs> trustworthy butler, I guess. But this would go under the chin to catch the hair. And then, you know, he's shaving him with the razor. And then he's also most likely maintaining his wigs. Trent would have had lots of wigs being a wealthy man. You know, they never wore their natural hair, except for George Washington. Uh, but uh, these are made from clay or bone. You put them near the fire and you heat them up. They're like hot rollers and then you can curl your wigs with them once you heat them up. Now we've got colonial money here. Um, each of the colonies printed their own money. So, and it was interchangeable. And then you had the coins that they would break up because they were pure silver. So they would break them up into what, what are called bits. So that's what they were doing. All right, that's what they mean when they say the bit, yeah. Shaving a haircut, really two bits. Yeah, that's, this is a bit. I thought, I thought it was always like two bits, like two bucks. No, it's, but it's this. Two bits of yeah. the silver coin. Yeah, oh, yeah. pieces yeah. of the silver coin, yeah. And then they would do this sort of thing to make the foam on the face. Okay. And through here is the Madam Trent's bedroom. Now this is where we think the butler slept at night. And we've got all these fabrics in here because Trent had quite a few fabrics on that probate inventory. So. So this is Madame Trent or Mary Trent's uh, bedroom. She has the largest bed in the house with the paint and molding at the top and the blue bed spread and curtains. And there are quite a few antiques uh, in this room, you know, period pieces. We've got this high boy here. Oh, the high boy because it's up on the legs. And then we've got the dressing table there in the corner that's also of the period. And uh, those three pieces on the opposite side of the room are also of the period. You ever borrow it on the holidays? <laughs> What's that? You yeah. ever borrow it for a holiday or a special occasion or something? No, the dress? <laughs> yeah. No. <laughs> they have a, there's another dress that they make me wear sometimes. Um, yeah, I think that's cool when, uh, like, the, um, the tour guide and stuff actually dresses, dresses the up. Bar. Sometimes yeah. they make me do it just for special events, though. Um, so these three pieces here are very interesting because what you have here is a female chair on the left and a male chair on the right. The female chair doesn't have arms because it has to accommodate the gigantic hoops that women would wear in their skirts at the time. Right. Um, and like Queen of Victoria, she's known for that. <laughs> generally speaking, the more money you yeah. had, the bigger your dress was, so that she wouldn't fit in that chair. Just with those hoops, it would be impossible for her to fit in that chair. So, gotta be in the arm of the chair. green guest bedroom and you'll notice that there's a rug on the bed. Um, they didn't put rugs on the floors very often in this time period because they just would have gotten ruined right away. They're tracking in all sorts of mud and stuff on their shoes so they're not going to take a handmade expensive rug and put it on the floor. So what they did was they put them on beds, walls, and tables. This particular type of rug is called a bed rug or a blanket rug. These would have been on all the beds in the winter time for warmth. Now your fancier rugs, your Persians, your Orientals, those would go on the walls and tables as like a decorative thing. 
But this shaggy style is, is specifically for beds. It's like a blanket. And the curtains on all the beds are for a very practical reason. They keep the bugs out. They keep the warmth in. And I'm sure it's for yeah, privacy there's no as screen well. windows or anything back right, then, no right? Right, screens in the windows. Uh-uh. on the beds, yeah. So they mainly be for, to, you know, to keep the mosquitoes out, I would think, mainly. So we can head back downstairs. There's two more rooms down there to show you. Oh, that reminds me. Do you have a place to put me up tonight? <laughs> in this room. Uh, I'm staying here tonight. You'd pay. You'd pay uh, a little bit of money to the owner of the house. You'd probably get a little something to eat. You'd get a little bit of food. Yeah. You know, and you'd have a place to sleep. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I mean, that's what it is. It's a So I'm going to take you down to the kitchen next. Hey, did there any dumb waiters in the house? No, there wasn't. Uh, I'm dumb surprised because usually like these houses with the ki and they had the kitchens with the servants in the bottom. They usually had the dumb waiters. No, this is a little early for that, you know. So this is the kitchen, and you've got uh, Joan down here. This is a representation of the enslaved cook that lived here. She probably cooked all the meals for the family. She probably cooked for the other slaves. Um, so lots of hard work for her. But we have a, sa a labor-saving device here. This is called the Clockwork Spit Jack. And what it does is it automatically turns the rotisserie spit. You crank it. Oh, yeah, you wind it up and then it goes down like a clock. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah. you can... so it turns the, the spit automatically. How often would you have to wind it? You I know? think it's like 20 minutes. On every 20 minutes? That's not too bad. Yeah, that's not too bad. Yeah, it's not, it's not bad. So, you know, you get the even cooking of the meat or whatever. And then you've got your bread toaster here that they would use. You put the two slices in, they toast with the one side, then you kick it and toast the other side. See that? Right. This one doesn't turn very well, but you get the idea. And then the bake oven is over here. See that hole in the wall there? That's the bake oven. That would have been for, you know, pies, cakes, mostly bread, though. And then um, we have what we have. you had to watch yourself when you're using oh. both at the same time. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> you, you, got one, you got a little pie here. It doesn't take up the whole thing. You have to walk right in there to deal no. with it. And load it, yeah. And um, her skirts, you know, were super long, so she has to really be careful so her skirts don't catch fire. Yeah, women, I don't want to be walking in there like in that dress. <laughs> yeah, a lot of women died because of that. In this you ever see some of those wedding videos where, um, the, um, like a bride would order lace and everything, and you go to blow out the candles on the cake, and, and they go up the oh, flames? No, yeah. <laughs> and I've seen that. Yeah, yeah. That's terrible. But um, these are cleaning supplies. They use gin, the alcohol, as an all-purpose cleaner. Sand was used for scrubbing. They used lime for the laundry. Now this like bleaches whites and it gets rid of stains. So this is like laundry detergent lime. And then here are your two basic ingredients in soap, animal fat and lye. And lye was cooked up with the animal fat and this made a very harsh soap. And the average family, this is the soap they're using, this sort of goopy stuff that they skim off the top. But obviously the trends are probably importing this nice bar soap from Europe or whatever. But the average family is having to make their own soap and candles. This is a candle mold. So this would make six candles at once. There were two dozen of these on the probate inventory, so we know probably one of the enslaved people here was making lots of candles. And the last room is through here. This is the 
storeroom. Um, as I said in the beginning, Trent was a shipping merchant. He dealt in all sorts of commodities, so you're talking about barrels of things. Barrels of wine, barrels of rum, barrels of tobacco, you know, sacks of grain, sacks of flour, all sorts of different things. He dealt in uh, wine, rum, furs, timber, rice, sugar, molasses, all sorts of different items he was trading. So that some of that would have been held down here and there would have been supplies for the house down here, etc., etc. Now, remember I told you there were huge additions on the east side of the house in the Victorian period? Right. This is it here. So this whole section was demolished. This whole right-hand section to the right of this chimney, all this was taken off. You got your original structure here. They had to remove that portico because that wasn't original. As you can see, this is what it looked like. Right, yeah, okay. And as you can see, they had to replace that cupola, which wasn't there in the 19th century. They had to rebuild that and replace it. So what'd they do? Uh sandblast it to get down to the original bricks? Because um, I noticed it was painted after, so they yeah, had to take so, that off. Right, this is painted a light right, color. Right, now I'm, I'm sure they don't want to re it. This is a light color, yes, yeah, so they had to sandblast it and remove all that light-colored paint to bring it back to its original brick colors. So. Yeah, so, lots of changes that took place over the years with the house. So there you go. Okay.